Hi everyone, my name is Tierra Brooks from School Based Health Alliance, and we would like to thank everyone for attending today's exciting webinar, Findings from the 2013-14 Census of School Based Health Centers. As we are all very eager to get started, we have a few housekeeping reminders today. To begin, if you are viewing as a group, please go to the chat window in the question box and type in the name of the person registered and the total number of additional people in the room. For example, Tammy Jones plus three. This will help us with our final attendance count. Also, all attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the question box located in your GoToWebinar control window. We will address questions following the presentation. Attendees will be asked to complete evaluation poll questions at the end of this webinar. Please let us know how we are doing. Your feedback is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in three to five business days. Please also visit School Based Health Alliance for additional archived webinars. Our panelists for today would include Ms. Erin Scheller. Erin Scheller is the Research and Evaluation Manager at the School Based Health Alliance. Erin earned her Master of Public Health degree from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, focusing on professional epidemiology, program planning, and evaluation. She has an undergraduate degree in anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis. Erin has a background in maternal and child and reproductive health, including work with Child Trends, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and the United States Agency for International Development. As a nurse trained at the University of Pennsylvania, she has on-the-ground experience with a variety of patient populations domestically and internationally. I would now like to turn it over to our presenter, Erin Scheller. Thanks for the introduction, Tiara. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we're pleased to discuss findings from the 2013-14 Census of SBHCs on behalf of the School Based Health Alliance and the entire Census team. I know that many of you on the webinar today took the time to complete our census survey, and then I know that some of you probably wondered what happened to the data. We appreciate your patience and interest in this release, so I want to start with a big thank you. We appreciate all of your hard work and commitment. As most of you likely know, we released the digital census report on January 7th last week, and you can find it on our website. Each of you who completed a survey will also a printed summary during School-Based Health Awareness Month in February, and the PDF will be available on our website as well. The census is a unique, one-of-a-kind survey. It is used to help us better understand where the school-based healthcare field is now and how far we've come, to identify areas of strength and for improvement, and the census is also used constantly to raise awareness about school-based healthcare. All the questions included are ones that are asked frequently on Capitol Hill and in state health departments, and the data allow us to answer the majority of questions that are asked. The census is also used to help think about the directions we want to move the school-based healthcare field in the future. We have a lot of census ground to cover today, beginning with how the census is conducted and data are analyzed. We'll examine how the school-based health center field has grown nationwide and how they provide access to a variety of comprehensive health services, including adolescent-centered care. SBHCs are integrated into healthcare systems through community partnerships, have sustainable business models, and high standards for accountability. Lastly, the School-Based Health Alliance has set ambitious goals for school-based health field to continue to expand on its service to child and adolescent health. We'll discuss how this census sets the stage and opportunities for future census surveys to align with our national quality initiative as well as other work. Our organization invests a great deal of time in an ongoing process for census data. We maintain an ongoing roster of SBHCs. The master database is updated continuously based on several procedures. We identify the opening and closure of SBHCs through relationships with our state affiliates, state government offices who fund SBHCs, 
our members, and daily monitoring of news articles published online about SBHCs. As we learn about new or closed programs, we update our database regularly. About six months before we launched the census, we reach out to states with state affiliates or emerging state affiliate offices for an updated list of all the SBHCs in their states, as well as contact information. We also reach out to state government offices that fund SBHCs for a list and contact information. In states without a state affiliate or state government contact, we reach out to representatives from known sponsor organizations that completed the previous census and ask for updated information. A few months after we've launched the census, we reached out to all the sites individually who hadn't yet started the census to confirm whether or not they were open or closed, update our contact information, and ask that they finish the survey. Through this outreach, we identified new programs that were not previously in our database. We also worked with state governments and affiliates and communicated with all of you in the field, as I'm sure you remember. Through these efforts, we achieved the highest completion rate in the history of the census at 82%, which we were thrilled about. This represents 1,900 known school-based health centers. For the 2013-14 school year, we identified 2,315 centers and programs connected with schools nationwide in 49 to 50 states, as well as Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. Since the 2010-11 census, school-based health centers were established in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. As far as we know, there were no school-based health centers in North Dakota during that school year. All of the 2,315 SBHCs are included on this map, regardless of whether they responded to a survey. We encourage you to use our new Children's Health and Education Mapping Tool, available on our website under the Resources section, to find your SBHC on an interactive map and use and view census data in a whole new way. The Alliance's 20th anniversary was last year, and we've seen steady growth in the number of SBHCs nationally since we began collecting the census in 1998. Since the 2010-11 census, 385 new centers were recognized, representing about 20% growth. We're very excited about this positive trajectory and hope to see this continue and improve in the future. The analysis for our digital report and the findings presented here include only school-based health centers that provide primary care, which represented 1,737 SBHCs that we identified. Those excluded from the analysis provide access to behavioral and or oral health services, but not primary care. We excluded them because unlike those that do provide primary care, their identification was less systematic and we're not confident that the data pertaining to these alternative models is generalizable. Missing data and do not know responses were also excluded from our analysis, and the number of respondents for each question is reported in our full methodology that you can find on our census webpage. SBHCs work consistently to improve access to healthcare, especially for underserved children and adolescents. Children and adolescents from low-income families experience disparities in health outcomes which are due in part to barriers in access and utilization of healthcare, influenced by factors like lack of healthcare providers, the intricacies of navigating a complex healthcare system, language barriers, and transportation. The CDC's community guide spent the past two years doing a systematic review of SBHCs, and the Community Preventive Services Task Force recommended SBHCs as an effective intervention, which means that the task force believes there is evidence that SBHCs can help successfully or can successfully help improve health equity and influence health and educational outcomes. One way that SBHCs address barriers and access to care is by meeting children where they spend their time, in school. SBHCs are primarily located in a school building or on school property, as reported by the majority of our census respondents. SBHCs typically serve multiple grade levels. Most commonly, an SBHC serves grades pre-K or kindergarten through 12th grade. They also serve high schools, elementary schools, and middle schools, and some serve a different mix of grade levels. 
SBHGs exist in all types of schools. Two-thirds are located in a traditional public school. We also know that SBHGs are important partners for community schools. As you can see on this slide, SBHGs serve diverse student bodies. SBHGs are in schools that serve a greater proportion of Hispanics and Latinos and African Americans and Blacks compared with average U.S. demographics. The average percent of white, Hispanic, and black students in schools with SBHCs are fairly similar, as you can see here. This shows that SBHCs are accessible to groups like Hispanics and blacks that we know are underserved in the traditional healthcare system. A little over half of school-based health centers serve a population in addition to students enrolled in their school. Among SBHCs that serve a population other than students enrolled in the affiliated school, most serve students from other schools, followed by families of students. During the 2013-14 school year, 77% of SBHCs served students where greater than 50% were eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Last census, virtually the same proportion of SBHCs served schools where greater than 50% of students were eligible, indicating continued SBHC involvement in underserved populations. Over three quarters of schools with an SBHC have Title I status. Title I schools receive financial support because they serve a large population of low-income children. This also demonstrates that we serve low-income populations. SBHCs are located in geographically diverse areas. For as long as data have been collected, the majority of SBHCs have been located in urban areas. This remains true for the latest census data. During the 2013-14 school year, approximately half of SBHCs were located in urban areas. However, the largest growth, growth of SBHCs since the 2010-11 census has been in rural areas accounting for nearly 60% of new SBHCs that we recognize in our database. To highlight the role of SBHCs in rural areas, many parts of rural West Virginia, schools make an important natural outpost for healthcare. Students who might have to commute long distances between home and school are captive audiences. For the close to 100 West Virginia schools that partner with primary health centers to bring care directly to campus, students don't have to miss valuable classroom seat time commuting to a sports physical, checkup, or acute care visit. We know that about 13% of West Virginia schools have an SBHC, and over 60% of counties in West Virginia have a school-based health center. Most of West Virginia's FQH, or FBHCs are sponsored by an FQHC, and about 67% of West Virginia's FQHCs currently sponsor a school-based health center. Our digital report includes some local stories to bring the census data to life and demonstrate what is going on in the field of school-based health, so we encourage you to check out them all out. As the number of FBHCs continues to grow, it's useful to consider their longevity. About one quarter of FBHCs have been open since or around the time of the last census. The majority have been open for 10 years or more. SBHCs are serving as medical homes for many children and adolescents and have corresponding hours of operation to best serve these students. Two-thirds of SBHCs are open full-time, which we define as 31 hours or more per week given the school schedule. The smaller proportion are open less than eight hours a week. Nearly all SBHCs are open during school hours, and most are also open after the school day ends. About half are open before the school day begins. The eligibility of SBHCs to be seen as a medical home has sometimes been questioned because even though many operate full-time, most are closed in the summer. About 40% remain open during the summer, and many SBHCs offer students another source of SBHCs often see it as their responsibility to offer students a pre-arranged source of after-hours care where they can access medical care when the SBHC is closed. About three-quarters report having some sort of on-call service provided by a sponsoring agency, health center staff, or an external agency. SBHC 
agency's staff and services are organized to identify, prevent, and remediate threats to student health, well-being, and academic success. They provide a wide range of services that address the physical, social, and emotional health of their patients in line with national guidelines supported by organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics. SBHCs employ a team of providers integrated within the clinical setting and the school to meet the complex medical, behavioral, and social health needs of children and adolescents. This multidisciplinary, comprehensive approach to care addresses the individual and structural determinants that affect the health of children and adolescents, including toxic stress, obesity, chronic conditions, substance use, and high-risk behaviors. The majority of SBHCs are staffed by a primary care provider and a behavioral health provider. The primary care and behavioral health team have long been a hallmark of the SBHC model, consistently serving in about two-thirds of SBHCs for the last 10 years or more. As this figure shows, in a growing number of SBHCs, the primary care provider and behavioral health provider team is complemented with experts in nutrition, health education, social services, oral health, and their vision services. About 50% of SBHCs have this expanded care model as of the 2013-14 census. As I mentioned, the analyses presented here include only SBHCs with primary care. Among the SBHCs included, the most common primary care provider types are nurse practitioners who serve in about 83% of school-based health centers. Medical doctors are present in about 40% of SBHCs, and physician's assistants are in about 15% of school-based health centers. SBHCs across the country also include other staff members. On-site providers include clinical support staff, who are especially common in health centers to run smoothly. These include medical assistants or health aides, administrative assistants or receptionists, licensed practical or vocational or registered nurses. Dentists and dental hygienists are also found in a number of school-based health centers, as well as nutrition, nutritionists and dietitians, health educators, and vision service providers. As you can see, telehealth, either alone or in combination with on-site providers, comprises a very small proportion of providers. SBHCs provide high-quality services students would receive in traditional medical offices including well-child visits, preventive screenings, and immunizations. Influenza was the most common immunization provided by SBHCs in the 2013-14 school year, with availability at 86% of centers. The vast majority also provide vision screening, essential for ensuring children are ready to learn, and chronic disease management, such as for asthma and diabetes. Nationwide, one in five youth suffer from a diagnosable emotional, mental, or behavioral disorder, but many do not receive needed care. SBHCs play a critical role in preventing, screening, and treating some of the most common behavioral issues known to affect student performance, health, and personal safety. Among the most common are depression, social conflict, anxiety, and attention disorders. Poor access to oral health care remains one of the most persistent health disparities in the United States. SBHCs help solve this problem by bringing dental services to children in school. In SBHCs, primary care providers may provide oral health services such as education, risk assessment, and screening. Fewer primary care providers treat oral health issues or prescribe and provide fluoride and sealant. Some school-based health centers also have oral health providers on staff who can help provide exams and other types of care. Adolescents remain a critical population at the heart of the school-based health care movement. Adolescence is a crucial time for development as students engage in relationships, experiment with risky behaviors, and have an expanded capacity for learning. Census findings reveal that the unique developmental needs of this age group remain a dominant focus in school-based health centers. Eight in 10 SBHCs serve students in sixth grade or higher. As 
these C's work upstream of the most prevalent and preventable adolescent morbidities by focusing on the knowledge, attitudes, skills, beliefs, and behaviors that empower adolescents to make positive decisions about their own health. SBHCs frequently provide individual counseling and preventive education on topics like substance use, including alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, dating violence, suicide prevention, violence prevention, and positive youth development. More than half of SBHCs have effectively harnessed the power of peer influence in adolescents by providing group-based activities and education. Groups represent an economically efficient delivery mode, sensitive to provider time limitations in the school setting for evidence-based approaches. Among SBHCs providing group-based socio-emotional wellness services to adolescents, topics include emotional health and well-being, positive youth development, interpersonal relationships, and school safety and climate. SBHCs promote a culture of health in schools and the community. A particular emphasis on healthy eating and active living has been undertaken by SBHCs for individual counseling, group work, and with parents and community members. As part of the Alliance's Hallways to Health initiative to move beyond the clinic walls, Northwood High School School-Based Health Center in Silver Spring, Maryland, engaged in several efforts to build a culture of health for both students and employees. They've hosted cooking classes, emphasizing healthy eating, and sponsored an after-school nutrition education program for students. Their Take Pounds Off Sensibly program has proven popular among employees, and Zumba fitness classes have brought both students and employees together to be more active. Sexual and reproductive health is an important aspect of normal adolescent growth and development. Adolescents in the U.S. experience poorer health and sexual and reproductive health outcomes compared to adolescents in other developed countries with high teen birth rates and a significant burden of sexually transmitted infections. Adolescents face numerous barriers to accessing sexual and reproductive health services, including confidentiality concerns and lack of financial resources and transportation. As a youth-friendly and accessible setting, SBHCs are uniquely positioned to deliver quality, confidential, sexual and reproductive health services. They provide services aligned with national standards that are in accordance with local policies. Among sexual and reproductive health services, abstinence counseling and pregnancy testing top the list. SBHCs also provide STI testing, diagnosis, and treatment. Fewer SBHCs provide prenatal care. Half of SBHCs are limited from dispensing contraception because of policies set by various entities. We have seen a decrease in the proportion of SBHCs where there is a contraceptive dispensing prohibition over the years since data collection began by the Alliance. In 1998 to 99, three quarters of sites were prohibited from dispensing contraception. Now that's down to about half of SBHCs which are prohibited from dispensing contraception on site. Where dispensing of contraception is prohibited, most commonly it's due to a school district policy. SBHCs reported entity setting policy that limited um, contraceptive dispensing, and in some cases there might be multiple policies in place, as you can see here. Among SBHCs that dispense contraceptives on site, Barrier methods are most commonly provided. This includes male or female condoms and a diaphragm. Hormonal methods are also dispensed by a majority of SBHCs that provide contraceptives, including birth control pills, Depo-Provera injectables, the patch, and the ring. Emergency contraception is provided by about three quarters of SBHCs that dispense contraceptives on site. Implantable devices like the implant or Nexplanon and IUD are provided by less than half of SBHCs perhaps related to these requiring additional provider training and expense to keep them in stock. Partnerships with the healthcare system and other organizations are crucial for starting and sustaining SBHCs. Most SBHCs have a medical sponsor to help administer their center, and some may have multiple partnerships. 
SCHCs are most often administered by health organizations committed to partnering with schools to provide care to hard to reach school age youth in their communities. In 2013-14, this included 43% of school-based health centers that were sponsored by federally qualified health centers and lookalikes, about 19% sponsored by hospitals, and 8% sponsored by health departments. Census data show that over the past 10 years, there has been an increasing trend toward FQHCs and lookalikes serving as sponsors, and a decreasing trend in the percentage of school system and local health department sponsored FBHCs. In 2013-14, about 750 school-based health centers were sponsored by 250 unique FQHCs and lookalikes. About 20% of the nation's 1,400 health center program grantees, FQHCs, and lookalikes nationwide partner with an SBHC to deliver care. Further growth in health center program grantee and lookalike sponsorship of SBHCs could help increase access to services for more students across the U.S. Hospitals across the country also redirect healthcare out of the medical complex and into neighborhoods where children live, grow, and learn. In communities with underserved populations where children have inequitable access to healthcare and preventive services, hospital investments in SBHCs can yield an important return on investment in population health. More than 100 hospital systems across the country have invested in about 330 school-based health centers. Some of the largest and most comprehensive local health department sponsors of SBHCs are in Boston, Cleveland County, North Carolina, Denver, Minneapolis, Multnomah County, Oregon, Seattle King County, and Washington, D.C. These health departments often sponsor SBHCs as part of their public health mission and partnership with other diverse local groups. Denver Health's investment in SBHCs has grown nearly 50% just in the past five years. This FQHC-SBHC partnership has been serving an additional 1,000 students each year to meet community needs. Denver Health's status as an FQHC allows the SBHCs and sponsors to qualify for additional grants and bill at an enhanced rate. This helps them to remain sustainable and keep their focus on providing services to students of Denver Public Schools. Denver Health reports that their FQHC network and integrated health care delivery system, which includes mental health services and health education, yields a more comprehensive medical home for students using their SBHCs. Their medical directors report that the data collection and reporting requirements for FQHCs promote high performance of their affiliated SBHCs, drive continuous quality improvement, and help them show the impact. Access to public and private insurance is critical to a sustainable business model for SBHCs. Like many of our nation's healthcare safety net providers, SBHCs rely on additional support, public and private grants, corporate donations, and in-kind contributions from community health organizations to finance aspects of the model left unfunded by insurance. Sustainability of the SBHC model relies on patient revenue. 90% of school-based health centers seek reimbursement for services from public and private health insurers. The majority of SBHCs have the capacity to and do at least some billing of Medicaid, both state agencies and managed care organizations, CHIP, private insurance, TRICARE or military insurance, and patients or families. This means that they have the billing infrastructure to seek reimbursement from these different Over three-quarters of school-based health centers receive insurance payment as a fee-for-service. Others receive payment as monthly or annual capitated payments for primary care, supplemental payments for meeting performance standards, or monthly or annual capitated payments for care coordination. Most SBHCs also receive funding outside of billing. State funds are an important source of financial support. Seven in 10 SBHCs report receiving some sort of state dollars for their operations. Federal grants are a critical funding source for about 54% of SBHCs. SBHCs often seek and receive additional support from private foundations. About 40% of SBHCs receive funding from private foundations. SBHCs partner with many stakeholders to create an integrated, countywide system of school-based health 
care with schools and school districts, county and city governments, as well as corporations and businesses. Top sources of federal funding include HRSA's SBHC capital program, Section 330 funding from HRSA, and Title X family planning. SBHCs strive for the highest standards of care that align with evidence-based practices and state and national guidelines and result in optimal health and education outcomes for students. They've been increasing their use of technology to help achieve high quality care. SBHCs document and report performance data in accordance with state and national child quality measurement framework. This is good news for our national quality initiative. Over three quarters of SBHCs participate in quality benchmarks and programs by using state-defined tools and measures. They also commonly participate and collect measures for HEDIS and SHIPRA. <laughs> SBHCs participate in rigorous accreditation efforts similar to other health provider organizations to document standards for coordination, access, comprehensiveness, and cultural competence. 70% of SBHCs have achieved some type of accreditation. Over two in five are accredited by state certification or the Joint Commission, and about one in five is accredited by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. The vast majority of SBHCs have some type of relationship with a managed care organization. Managed care organizations recognize SBHCs in a variety of ways, including getting reimbursed for services, recognition as a preferred provider, or recognition as a specialty care provider. The dramatic uptake of technology by SBHCs over the years, including the use of electronic health records, reflects a sector that's eager to adopt tools that greatly enhance quality and accountability through documentation, coordination, and exchange of information with care partners. Since 2008, the first time health information technology appeared in the census, the number of SBHCs using electronic health records and electronic prescribing have increased by about 50%, and the use of electronic billing has increased by about 25%. You can see from this figure that the majority of SBHCs use some form of health information technology, in particular EHRs or EMRs. Management information and practice management systems were less common, but were still used by over two-thirds of school-based health systems. Lastly, adoption of telehealth technology is not widespread, with about 7.3% of SBHCs using telehealth technology to provide care in underserved areas. However, Rural areas are more likely to use telehealth services, with about 13% of SBHCs using in rural areas. One example of the use of telehealth technology to reach rural areas is the Center for Rural Health Innovation in North Carolina. The center operates a school-based telehealth program to improve access to care among rural children and adolescents in close to 20 schools. In North Carolina's mountainous western counties, public schools are often remote and have smaller than average school populations. Telehealth bridges access to care for children in schools such as these that cannot support a physical SBHC. Telehealth technology maximizes provider time and student seat time by eliminating the need for transportation. By the end of the 2013-14 school year, the center had rolled out telehealth to all of the public schools in their two county service area so that every student in those counties had access to health care at school every day. I appreciate your attention as I know this was a lot of information and data to take in. You can find some of the more detailed information about the census methodology and tables of key findings on our census webpage. And if anyone has questions about how to get there, I can show you at the end. We're thrilled to release these 2013-14 data and present the information digitally, but I want to take a couple minutes now to think about where the census is going. The next census will be for the 2016-17 school year, and how it aligns with the Alliance's larger vision around our more and great goals for the school-based healthcare field in the next few years. 
Collecting census data over the last 20 years has shown the importance of knowing what is going on in the field. We know a lot about basic characteristics of health centers, such as demographics, staffing, services, policies, and financing. We've collected them for decades through the census and were presented here today. We know a lot, in fact, about the what and how of SBHCs, just not the how well. How well are we meeting students' needs? How many students are receiving the care they need? These are questions that we have not been able to easily answer in the past, but this is about to change. As many of you know, in September 2014, the Alliance and the Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland were jointly awarded a four-year cooperative agreement from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, or MCHB, to improve and grow the school-based healthcare and comprehensive school mental health field. MCHB has set out ambitious objectives. They want to see a 30% increase in the number of SBHCs by 2018. A 30% increase means that thousands more kids have access to care, and we are committed to improving. They also want to see 50% of SBHCs voluntarily adopting, documenting, and reporting standardized performance measures. We applaud our pioneers from eight participating teams that represent two school-based health alliance state affiliate organizations, four state or county departments of health and public health, 22 sponsoring organizations, and more than 60 participating school-based health centers in eight different states who are participating in a learning collaborative on standardized performance measures and sustainable business practices. We believe the opportunity has the potential to transform the school-based healthcare field and create a culture of accountability through the development of standardized performance measures, collecting data that's relevant, actionable, and can accelerate quality improvement, and expanding the number and improving the quality of SBHCs. We hope that the CDC's community guide recommendation will help increase awareness about and encourage the growth of the school-based healthcare model. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has selected the number of school-based health centers as one of their measures to mobilize a culture of health nationally. As part of their initiative, they have awarded the Alliance a planning grant to reinvigorate the way we collect census data. Health centers are not required to report census data as a condition of funding. You all do so because you value the data and we plead with you to do it, but we know it gets a little bit harder every year. As part of this grant, we will be working with RAND Corporation and revisiting what questions are asked to create a streamlined survey that helps align the census and the NQI core data. We will investigate how to most effectively collect data from the field because we recognize the burden on field staff and sponsors and administrators, as well as the increasing value of health data. Please stay tuned to hear more about this in the coming months and years. Lastly, we invite and encourage you to explore the census data in more detail through our Children's Health and Education Mapping Tool, a new online interactive resource for individuals seeking to address chronic inequities among low-income children and adolescents and healthcare access and utilization. There are many people to thank for their contributions to the preparation of the census. A team of advisors came together and gave hours to the preparation of the survey. And I want to thank the other Alliance staff members and interns who helped collect data and prepare this report, especially Haley Lofink Love, Kyle Taylor, Anna Burns, Matt Even, John Schlitt, Jessica Danow, Megan Couillard, Daisha Windham, and Della Serti. We are also grateful to our funders at the Health Resources and Services Administration's Maternal and Child Health Bureau and Bureau of Primary Health Care, as well as the Atlantic. And most importantly, we're grateful to you for completing the survey and making all of this analysis possible. We hope that you're able to use it to tell others about what an SBHC is and about the critical work that you do every day. This report is for you. It honors the work that you do, and we really hope it's a useful tool. Thank you. Now I'm happy to take any questions. All right, everyone, we'd like to thank Erin so much for this wonderful presentation. Right now, we'd like to give everyone the opportunity to please put in your questions into the questions box so we can um, ask Erin why you, why you have her available. Um, or you can send the questions into research at sbhforall.org. Um, but while we give you a chance to enter your questions, 
we would like to just mention a few things for School Based Health Alliance. First, you want to talk about our membership. School Based Health Alliance works to improve the health status of children and youth by advancing and advocating the school based health care. Our members extend and support our work. We ask you all to please join us if you're not already a member. We offer two options for membership, individual and organizational. Organizational memberships are $500 a year, include discounts on professional services and products, letters of support for grants, newsletters, and more. Individual memberships are $100. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our membership, please visit our website at sbhforall.org. We also ask that to visit our website for more information, not just about membership, but also any technical assistance and our mapping tool. Um, if you'd like to know more information about our mapping tool, we also have an upcoming webinar this Thursday, so we ask that you please visit our site for more information and register. Right now, we'd like to give everyone one minute to answer their questions. Great, so I see one question from Elizabeth, hi Elizabeth, um, about whether it's possible to print the new digital report from our website. And that is a question which is wonderful and I unfortunately do not know the answer to the best way to print that, so we'll check with our communications team and follow up with you all. All right, we see more questions coming in, so we just give us a few seconds and we'll, we see them rolling and just give us one second, please. Okay, we're actually going to pull up a visual for a couple of our questions. Just one moment. And I see that Sarah has a few questions about the SBHC standard measures of care. Um, I'm assuming that you're referring to our new national quality initiative. Um, and I don't sit on that team, but I can tell you that they are currently forming a number of teams that are participating in the first round of the National Learning Collaborative. So that is currently underway. And you can find out more information about that um, on our website under, if you look at the NQI. And we can also um, give you the information for our program manager for that program. I can say that they selected five core measures and several stretch measures that they're planning to use to help um, SBHCs start collecting performance measures. Um, but we don't have any data to share at, that, at this point. All right, and we can also follow up with members of the team um, and get back to you um, after the webinar. I, 
And I see a question from Shepard. To what extent is there movement to bring school information systems involving grades and behavior together with health information systems? So that has been something that's traditionally a challenge for school-based health centers due to HIPAA and FERPA, which is the um, policy that protects educational data. Um, as far as movement to bring those together, I think that's something that people are continuing to hope that we can make progress on, but I don't know of any particular um, initiatives that we have going on right now. Um, but we can, if you write in to us, we can also um, check with some of our colleagues who might have more information on that for you. I also see a question about partnerships between pediatricians, school boards, and community leaders. Um, so I can say that there is no typical relationship. Um, School-based health centers are definitely a very local um, entity, which depends on how the community comes together, their sponsor organizations, different values in that community. So I think that it varies greatly. Um, and we, unfortunately, don't ask that type of qualitative information in our census report. Okay, we're going to give you a few more seconds. Um, if you have any additional questions or if you'd like to be um, any more details, um, just go ahead and put it in a question box and we'll be happy to answer to the best we can. For those that we're not able to get to today, we will definitely send it off to the appropriate program and definitely get back to you. Thank you. Okay, um, we just want to make sure anyone doesn't have any more questions. Um, we're going to give maybe a few more seconds um, before we close the webinar. We still want to give everyone an opportunity if you have any questions. 